You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 11, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, occupational asthma. Our presenter is Dr. David Bernstein. He's a professor in the Department of Medicine and Environmental Health and in the Division of Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology at the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio. Well, uh, thank you, and certainly a pleasure to to be here again uh, in the COLA series. I really enjoy doing this every year, and uh, would like to really present a uh, working uh, knowledge for you of occupational asthma that you can apply to the patients that you may be seeing uh, in the future. So um, without further ado, we go to the next slide. Uh, why is it important for us to discuss occupational asthma? Uh, it is still the most common occupational lung disease and it can cause or exposure in a work environment can cause significant worsening of asthma symptoms in up to 15 percent of asthmatics and if we don't diagnose uh, these cases early and manage uh, occupational asthma particularly those due to sensitizers found in the work environment uh, we know that patients if they continue to be exposed and symptomatic will have severe persistent asthma and this can result in uh, accelerated decline in their lung function. So what is the prevalence of occupational asthma? We really aren't, don't have a good handle on this uh, and we'll talk a little bit about definitions but if we talk about as occupational asthma as defined by uh, asthma actually induced by something encountered in a work environment. We know there are various causes. Some of these are allergens or we also like to call them respiratory sensitizers if they're chemicals because we haven't really defined an immune mechanism for some of the chemicals although we have for uh, allergenic proteins encountered in the work environment. But here are some prevalences by industry and some of these numbers are not updated but for instance up to five percent of sawmill workers exposed to red cedar wood dust can develop uh, sensitization and occupational asthma to an organic acid in the wood dust known as placatic acid. Uh, isocyanate is a major cause of occupational asthma in plastics and urethane workers can cause occupational asthma in a small percentage of workers uh, and we know that uh, laboratory animal workers or breeders can also become sensitized to um, animal allergens. Baker's asthma, up to 10 to 30 percent of bakers who are chronically exposed to flower dust can develop occupational asthma. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, we need to really discuss categories of work-related asthma. Not all asthma encountered in the workplace is caused by sensitization to something at, at work and when we talk about this broad term at the top of this figure work-related asthma this includes occupational asthma that is asthma induced by something encountered at work de novo versus uh, work aggravated asthma which is also very common probably more common that is individuals who have pre-existing asthma for which some stimulus at work aggravates their asthma symptoms and this, these two are the subcategories for which we will refer to work-related asthma. Now, in terms of occupational asthma induced by something at work, you can see at the bottom of the figure there's sensitizers, sensitizer-induced occupational asthma. This can be due to either highly reactive chemicals uh, inhaled uh, through the ambient work environment or protein allergens uh, that follow a typical IgE mediated type of hypersensitivity pattern, but it also could include uh, irritant induced asthma or asthma induced by a, a short term exposure to a respiratory irritant. We'll talk in more detail about that. In this case, 
Uh, this can occur within a very short period of time after exposure to this to an irritant. Uh, overall, though, we define occupational asthma as variable airflow obstruction, airway inflammation, attributable to a particular exposure in the workplace and not to stimuli encountered outside the workplace. So typically, when we talk about occupational asthma due to a respiratory sensitizer that's encountered at work, there's usually a long period of exposure or a variable period of exposure prior to the development of uh, allergic sensitization or respiratory sensitization. And um, after sensitization has occurred, thereafter, uh, low levels of exposure subsequently can cause uh, symptoms. And this is typical of, say, a protein allergen like um, an enzymes used to make uh, part of the ingredients in the detergents. Enzymes are very important uh, components of, uh, of laundry detergents, for instance. Once you develop sensitization, as with any allergy, it takes much lower levels of exposure to induce or elicit uh, upper and lower respiratory symptoms. And then sensitivity uh, tends to increase with continued exposure. Uh, typically, if we're talking about high molecular weight allergens, that is proteins, these uh, usually, if not always, are often associated with a positive uh, skin prick test to the uh, protein allergen encountered at work or an elevated and or an elevated specific IgG level. Uh, however, chemical sensitizers, which often behave much like protein allergens, are very uh, the mechanism isn't well defined for many, many of these, and they're not always, in many cases, not clearly Ig mediated. That, that is, we can't really demonstrate clearly an Ig response associated with sensitization to these chemical agents that cause occupational asthma. We'll discuss that more as we go along. Okay. So, if we talk about the uh, irritant-induced occupational asthma, this is uh, usually an acute process. And this is a form of occupational asthma not caused by a sensitizer, but caused by some exposure, high-level exposure to an irritant, such as uh, chlorine gas can be due to a smoke inhalation, encountered an, an accidental you know, exposure to chlorine gas or uh, smoke inhalation or sulfur dioxide. Uh, and the patients generally, uh, this is a diagnosis that's made retrospectively after the uh, asthma begins, there is no previous or prior history of asthma prior to the exposure episode. And uh, patients thereafter, after they uh, have this exposure, then develop uh, lower respiratory symptoms within a very short period of time. This can be manifested as cough or just wheezing, uh, often beginning within the first day after exposure. Uh, airway hyperresponsiveness is uh, necessary to make this diagnosis, and it usually uh, has to be confirmed uh, months after uh, the exposure. So these patients have persistent symptoms which last months or years following the initial exposure. And uh, to make this uh, diagnosis, you have to be able to demonstrate a uh, positive methacholine test defined as a PC20 of at least 16 milligrams per ml. Uh, many times, uh, PFT spirometry is normal um, and, however, reversible airway obstruction can be uh, demonstrated in a significant minority of workers, and these patients uh, always have a normal chest x-ray. We talk about now work-aggravated asthma, and this has uh, really drawn a lot more attention in, in recent years. I should mention that um, all these different categories can actually coexist. They're not mutually exclusive. But work-exacerbated uh, asthma uh, is really uh, the asthma is pre-existing. So, a typical scenario would be a, a patient who has allergic or any allergic asthma due to allergens or seasonal asthma, and then at work, when they're if they have a heavy uh, uh, heavy exertional load that or they have to do a lot of exertion at the, in the workplace, or if they're in a cold air environment, they can develop bronchospasm simply by doing their job. Um, or if they have some exposure to a small exposure to an irritant, this would be enough to induce bronchospasm in a patient with existing asthma. Uh, and this, uh, I mean, some of the data suggests that uh, that uh, asthma 
uh, can be aggravated in 15% of all asthmatics at work. And sometimes it can be very difficult to distinguish work aggravated asthma from uh, occupational asthma, that is asthma caused by some, uh, induced by some de novo exposure in the work environment. And here are some just examples of uh, some of the triggers that can be encountered at work that can aggravate pre-existing asthma, increase work aggravated asthma symptoms uh, shown in this slide. Uh, now, we also have to consider in the differential diagnosis several other um, conditions which can sometimes confound the diagnosis. And uh, again, we're going to go through the methods of how you really confirm a diagnosis subjectively of occupational asthma. But if you suspect occupational asthma due to something encountered at work that is induced by something at work, of course, you have to uh, rule out pre-existing asthma with simply being aggravated you have to evaluate whether the patient has COPD, chronic smoker, for instance. Uh, sometimes with uh, very caustic exposures to very toxic uh, ambient exposure in a workplace, one can develop a destruction of the bronchioles, such as bronchiolitis obliterans. One example of that is uh, popcorn workers' lung diacetyl, which is a uh, chemical that was used to make, um, say, Jiffy Pop, you know, that brand but the uh, at-home popcorn, automatic, uh, the popcorn kits, uh, the, the workers who manufactured this uh, were exposed to this and developed, uh, they had sort of an epidemic of bronchiolitis of which, was, which which now is not a problem, but at one time it was, just one example. But any exposure to a caustic chemical, for instance, um, acidic or a basic compound, uh, can induce bronchiolitis in the work environment. Uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is not a uh, primarily a uh, airway disease, and it's an airspace disease involving uh, the parenchyma and interstitium of the lung, is due to sensitization to usually uh, organic matter in a work environment, usually uh, spores that are inhaled, very small spores that usually are inhaled into the lung, or these can be due to protein antigens such as um, uh, avian proteins in, in individuals who have a lot of birds at home. Uh, this is a possible diagnosis that can also confound the diagnosis of occupational asthma. Metal fume fever is occurs among uh, welders, and if you weld zinc, if you're a, a galvanized steel welder, uh, zinc or aluminum oxides are released uh, in the process. And if you inhale these, it can induce a cytokine release syndrome in the lungs, uh, releasing uh, TNF alpha and IL-1, which induces a febrile type of response, but this is not asthma. This is a uh, transient uh, syndrome which, from which the workers recover. Organic toxic dust syndrome in certain uh, agricultural environments, particularly enclosed environments such as um, sheds where they keep a lot of animals and they have a lot of fecal material endotoxin accumulates, uh, workers sometimes can be overcome by uh, exposure to uh, toxic materials in this organic dust, such as endotoxin or mycotoxins. And that, again, is a transient response, but not an asthmatic condition. Uh, we also have to differentiate this from uh, paradoxical vocal cord motion or VCD. A common thing you see in the workplace is obviously not asthma, but this can be induced uh, in certain workers exposure to uh, certain chemical smells or perfumes, this is something we commonly see in our office environments. To diagnose occupational asthma, uh, it's important to objectively confirm this in a work, work environment. And uh, medical history is not very sensitive at all. So if you just uh, take a history and the worker says, well, I get worse at work when I'm around this particular uh, chemical or work in this process, and I develop asthma, and I get better at home, uh, it may be a sensitive tool, the history may be a sensitive tool, but not very specific, and we really need to confirm uh, the presence of work-related asthma or occupational asthma objectively. So the best tools we have now are actually uh, following the worker. We can still do that while he's still symptomatic at work. and. Uh, 
and go through this uh, sort of algorithm we have presented here in the slide. Uh, first, if the history is consistent, one then would recommend confirming or determining whether the worker is suspected of occupational asthma has asthma or not. So the first test that you could do would be a simple spirometry before and after a bronchodilator. And if the patient has reversibility, that confirms asthma. In the absence of any reversibility and normal lung function, we could also do a methacholine test, and this is advised to be done while the worker is still at work or after they come off the work shift because uh, it can change. And if the um, PC20 and the methacholine test is four milligrams uh, or less, this is uh, highly uh, predictive of asthma. So these are two ways you can do that. Uh, if there's an allergen suspected, one can uh, test to see if the worker is sensitized to whatever uh, occupational allergen or protein one suspects at work. Um, but then it really is incumbent on the physician uh, to uh, demonstrate, uh, to really confirm the diagnosis, a decline in lung function while the worker is working with the suspect agent causing the occupational asthma and improving away from, from exposure to that uh, agent or process. So here's uh, typical uh, history, and it's very important to take a comprehensive history. We always ask the worker, uh, first, have they had any problems uh, with the job? Have they had any health problems on the job? And then we ask specifically whether they experience uh, asthmatic symptoms, as you can see here, uh, while at work. And if yes, uh, the symptoms begin right after coming to work, or are they, uh, do they begin uh, in a delayed fashion? Sometimes they can begin hours after coming to work, or even after uh, leaving work. Uh, this does not exclude occupational asthma. In fact, uh, in many cases of chemical sen uh, respiratory sensitization, uh, there's a late asthmatic response absent an early response, and the onset of symptoms can be delayed or hours after initiation of exposure in the work, at the workplace and the work field. Uh, and then we always ask them, uh, do they improve on the weekends or on vacations? Uh, obviously, this is important. And in most cases, they do improve. But there's some circumstances in which the disease is far advanced and they may not improve all that much when they go home. So we have to be aware of that as well. So um, some of the other questions we ask is, do your symptoms begin with months after a job change or a new agent was introduced into the workplace? And then we <clears throat> always, uh, because the worker may not know that, the worker may just know they have problems, but they're using many different things, exposed to many different things, and not aware of anything specific that's causing a problem. And so we always ask for MSDS sheets, which the, work, the workplace management is uh, obligated to provide. And then we uh, review these to see if there are any agents uh, in the work environment or that are known to cause occupational asthma. And uh, we also ask if other workers are affected and have workers in the past left this job because of similar symptoms. It's often something we call a survivor effect, that there may be one person in the work environment, but many have had problems and have left on unknown, uh, for unknown reasons. So if we can, we like to do immunologic assessment to confirm sensitization. Although sensitization does not is not diagnostic of occupational asthma, you still need to uh, show work-related changes in lung function, as we uh, had discussed earlier. But it can be very helpful. For instance, if you have a like an enzyme or something like a bacterial or uh, microbial enzyme used for, uh, say, by detergent workers. It's quite easy for, to prepare, and we do this, uh, and this has been done in industry, a skin prick test uh, reagent uh, to test screen workers uh, for sensitization. Generally speaking, uh, if you have isolated potential allergen, absence of a positive skin test has pretty good negative predictive value, and it would usually exclude uh, occupational asthma due to a specific agent, 
uh, if it's a protein, an allergenic protein in most cases. Um, and we would have to prepare these in our laboratory. Most uh, These are not standardized. We don't know really the potency. Uh, and so this is a real unmet need in terms of uh, having available antigens to test uh, exposed workers at risk and to work in them. Next slide. So again, here is the, uh, uh, the algorithm that we like to use, and uh, we've already discussed this to some extent, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, again, this just shows the uh, spirometry, which is something we recommend uh, for all workers when they're being evaluated initially, and you're all familiar with this. Next slide. Uh, so the point about we'll go back. The point about this is that if you have reversibility, it confirms uh, asthma. But as we said, if you have a normal spirometry and don't show reversibility, it doesn't rule out occupational asthma. And if you've demonstrated asthma uh, in a worker, again, that doesn't confirm occupational asthma unless you can show uh, reduction in lung function related to work exposure. So we also have found the methacholine inhalation test quite a useful tool for workplace evaluation of occupational asthma. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have done methacholine testing, but it's a very useful tool for this purpose. So we've already discussed uh, the utility of doing a methacholine test to investigate whether the worker does or does not have asthma. Data that the uh, go back the PC20 if it's below or equal to four milligrams per ml confirms asthma, so it's very useful initially trying to determine whether it's If the uh, piece, if the PC20 is uh, above 16 milligrams per ml, that actually has very good negative predictive value in excluding asthma. So for instance, if you did a methacholine test and the a worker was exposed to work with symptomatic and fatal more than a few hours and went to the lab and did a methacholine test and tested negative, that is greater than 16 20, that essentially would rule out asthma and occupation. So uh, here's a drill, here's a peak flow meter, and simple thing, but very useful uh, in evaluating occupational asthma. We know that peak flow measurements have gotten a bad rap, but if the patient is well trained and can do good effort, provides us quite useful information for evaluating asthma in the workplace, but also asthma in general. Any of your patients in the clinic will have uh, present the diagnostic dilemmas, you might really have asthma. We always go to the closed. And uh, again, this is uh, the instructions that we give to the patients. These are written instructions, and we do these with the patient before we have again taking our measurements for the device level. Be sure you don't back it up. Take as deep as possible, low, hard, fast, you long inhalation, uh, and we need to see reproducible reading. So we tell the workers who are evaluating, we can evaluate for uh, two weeks work, and two weeks away from the future, and they need to do at least four reporting a day. Through the week as well, so we can compare measurements taken on the and away from the uh, And it's, uh, believe it or not, can be done, but you have to keep reinforcing production.
Oh, uh, Bernstein? Go ahead. Breaking out a little bit. Are oh, you by your mic? Oh, you were breaking out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Hear you. Okay. Oh, no worries. Okay. All right. <laughs> that, that's good. <laughs> okay, let's go forward again. Okay. Yeah. So here is uh, what we do with these, these readings, these numbers, and there's uh, different ways we can assess this. Uh, one that we traditionally use is calculating the uh, daily variability in peak flow rate. And this is simply done by taking all the peak flow measurements over a 24-hour period, subtracting the minimal peak flow measurement, and we always take maximal, maximal reading for uh, free efforts, subtracting it from the maximal peak flow rate uh, over the maximum peak flow rate, multiplying by 100, and that gives a simple percent variability for that day. And you can see that uh, anything at around 15, above 15 percent, we consider uh, significant. You can see how easily this can be done. And uh, this shows really that another way of, of assessing these measurements is simply plotting these out against time in a linear fashion. And you can see that uh, the peak flows really decrease or decline. This uh, graph this diagram on the workers' work, they, tend to improve away from work. And uh, one other thing that we like to do is do methylcholine, serial methylcholine testing after the uh, two weeks at work. So on the last day, we'll pull the worker out and do a methylcholine test. You can see that in this case, uh, the worker obviously had, had low readings, but also had a reduced PC20. And then this uh, PC20 improves uh, after being away from work proofs. So this validates, uh, in a sense, the peak flow rates are uh, able to be verified, not, not falsified. Okay. So this is this one sort of fail-safe way of just, uh, you know, assessing the veracity of individual peak flow rates which are done by the work. So this is just a study that was done, published in the Blue Journal years ago, and it shows that uh, there are several ways you can analyze peak flow rates. Uh, but according to this study, uh, the visual analysis, having uh, two or three physicians who are blinded to the patient's evaluation of care, uh, just looks at the graph and decides whether uh, the um, peak flow rates are consistent with work-related asthma. It seems to have the best sensitivity and specificity for occupational asthma. In this study, occupational asthma confirmed by doing specific relation challenge tests, which is the gold standard for, uh, for actually making the diagnosis. Now, unfortunately, in the U.S., it's, only, it's illegal to do a specific ventilation challenge testing routinely as a diagnostic tool, except for unless you were to have an IND or something in the study. So it's really something you can do, not do. You don't have a uh, but it is quite a good way of confirming the diagnosis. It's routinely done in Canada and various countries in Europe. And again, the method polling testing uh, test the previous test for evaluation. No, so this uh, this really confirms the other uh, thing that if we're doing the serial peak flow rate uh, and we do uh, method polling at the end of the two weeks of exposure, again at the end of two weeks away from exposure, if it if the uh, peak flow rate is 16 milligrams or less, this validates a positive peak flow rate. Uh, that is a reduction in lung cancer. So um, let's go to a, a few cases and uh, we discuss some specific scenarios or causes of occupational asthma. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So the first case is a 42-year-old um, gentleman with a uh, two-year history of asthma. And he happens to be a, a painter. He's spraying hard metal surfaces in an auto body shop. And he works with urethane paint. He's a really very... Um, 
heavy duty paints, the um, uh, urethane, uh, very useful for painting, you know, hard metal surface, gives these uh, paints a, uh, a long sort of uh, lifespan. Uh, but they have to be urethane paints or epoxy paints. In this case, the urethane paints. And after eight months on the job, he uh, has some wheezing and shortness of breath. Again, it's one to three hours after starting the work shift. And this continues uh, up to 12 hours after leaving work. Uh, we do a spirometry test at uh, work and find that he has reversible airway obstruction. And he now uh, having to say, well, I can't work anymore. Um, I have to apply for workers' compensation. So the question here, if you can see the bottom of the slide, is what is the most likely cause and how do we evaluate this patient? Does anybody have any idea what the most likely cause is? Thinking the isocyanates right. um, is the painting. Right. So this would, uh, we would immediately suspect if it's a urethane paint, uh, hexamethyl And how do we go about And so how do we evaluate the, uh, the patient? Uh, we're going to use the algorithm that we, we just uh, discussed. Go to the next slide, please. So this is a, a spray painter, and this this gentleman is um, is applying uh, urethane paint, and as you can see, there are two different hoses. One hose is pumping in the hexamethylene diacetylate, and the other is the monomer, which is an alcohol, uh, and then these two components actually polymerize right, as it sprays it onto the hard metal surface. So in the process, he has potential inhalational, he has inhalational exposure or accidental exposure to the uh, disocyanate, but he's wearing protective equipment. And, but uh, sometimes this equipment leaks, and over time, and a lot of these workers sometimes get it on their skin, and they can actually develop sensitization to uh, HDR, has skin. So again, it doesn't happen to a lot of workers, but it may affect up to 2 to 5% of chronicles. And these are sort of chemical structures of the... Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. These are the uh, chemical structures of the isocyanates. See that they're, uh, most of these are, have aromatic ring structures. Uh, but the one at the bottom is HDI. And they call him Yeah. And um, so these are highly reactive, and they readily bind to tissue proteins, or they can just be inactivated by contact with water vapor and hydrolyzed. But if they find their way to the lung tissue, they can have uh, irritant effects or even induce uh, local respiratory sensitization. So it affects minority workers. Nevertheless, uh, the workers who uh, do, a, do develop occupational asthma become quite sick. Next slide. And as you can see, isocyanates were many years in the 1990s top list of uh, potential agents that cause asthma or occupational asthma, they declined in prevalence recently uh, since 2009, 2010. This may be due to the fact that much of the manufacturing has moved offshore to other countries and no longer done as much in the United States. And again, so uh, we use the same uh, methodology for peak flow rates that I just discussed to confirm uh, occupational asthma in this worker. You see the decline over the period of exposure and peak flow rate. And you can see the variability, environmental variability, and the improvement uh, when the worker is not exposed. Excellent. This uh, gives an idea what these uh, challenge chambers look like that are really 
used in uh, Canada, have been developed in Canada and Europe, and uh, these are high-tech machines that you can generate and exposure and continuously monitor the isocyanate and then have the work inhale a measurable amount of isocyanate, so these can be done quite safely without causing the worker to get sick um, and um, in a controlled environment. Uh, but again, we don't have access. Next slide. But this does show some of the results of specific elation testing that has been done and published. You can see that there are different patterns of response with the uh, classic allergens, of course, left top panel. Uh, you see an immediate early response asthmatic response with the decline in the FEV1 and then recovery. Uh, you can see a dual response um, with a lower panel on the right uh, with an early and a late phase response. Uh, airway hyper response increases often if it was a late phase response. I didn't know EC20 can, can decline very rapidly after a single allergen inhalation challenge. We also see on the left bottom, the isolated late phase response, which can occur up to 40% of work sensitized chemicals like isocyanates or wood dust. And this, uh, this isolated late phase response is tricky because it can sometimes start even towards the end of the work shift. So one has to recognize. Now here is a list of the, of the major chemical causes of occupational asthma, and something you probably should remember for future reference. Uh, the isocyanates, uh, the main one to be discussed, hexamethylene disocyanate that's used in spray paint, urethane paints, timely disocyanate, we use that much anymore because it's highly volatile. Can you hear me? Uh, just breaking up a little bit, but we can still hear you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No worries. Um, toluene diisocyanate, which, which is highly volatile um, and not used all that much, and one that's most commonly used is diphenylmethane diisocyanate MDI, uh, which is um, actually uh, used to make most of the polyurethane products, which are used now as insulation in houses, for dashboards and cars, and have a wide variety of applications. They're also used to make the various very tough glues and adhesives. So there's a bunch of industries that use these uh, isocyanates primarily as polymerizing agents uh, for these a variety of applications. Now one should also be aware of another group of chemicals that cause occupational asthma, referred to as um, acid anhydrides, and these structures have anhydride rings. One is trimolytic anhydride, which is well described in the literature, and phthalic anhydride. Both of these can cause uh, IgE-mediated sensitization, so you can actually skin test with uh, protein conjugates made with these chemicals and show a positive skin test. In fact, workers, this is a rare example when this is possible. Uh, these are workers who would be exposed to this, who work in uh, with plasticizers, manufacture these chemicals, Plasticide is used to be coating and epoxy products. So a, a worker in the plastics industry might be exposed to acid and hydrides. We talked about wood dust, which are also very important causes of occupational asthma. These would be seen in carpenters who work with red cedar uh, wood. Uh, so cedar, any cedar wood or planks, uh, you might have noticed they have very pungent kind of odor that be due to the plicatic acid, which is thought to be the organic chemical which is positive of occupation in these in these workers. Uh, electronic soldering workers who use colophony fluxes may be exposed to acids. These fluxes also prevent cause occupation. Another example is macrolate, which is encountered by healthcare workers who work with surgical cement, perhaps nurses well, joint replacement might have exposure to heat. Uh, other causes would be metals, such as platinum salts, which can be 
reduce IGE made of sensitization in platinum refining workers. Solutions of these salts can be sensitive to chromate, metal plating, nickel, vanadium. All these workers can develop, the welders can develop occupational health metal. And then in the uh, pharmaceutical work, or even uh, hospital work, to inhale powder, say, emanating from just mixing or working antibiotics or drugs, these can induce sensitivity as well. Let's go on to the slide. So, uh, industrial cleaners, uh, so people that use work in kitchens where they use street strain industrial cleaners, uh, there's the chemical or being heat or salt or am I the center? And uh, cosmetic workers, hairdressers use bleaches for sulfate, uh, which can also do like an example of health care work, both the highest the food or outside, and so on and so on. Next slide. Let's to the next case. And a 29-year-old baker uh, who has sneezing, wheezing, shortness of breath at work, uh, has developed also a uh, history of people allergy and asthma, which began during childhood, and has been wheezing and having shortness of breath for the last few years only on days when they make uh, dough and, make, and this generates a lot of flour. And exposed to rye and wheat flour as well as amylase and pain uh, in the flour that choose to make the bread. Next. We're starting to lose you again. Oh, you are. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So the uh, lung function is normal, and uh, the patient uh, uh, has sensitization to wheat and uh, rye uh, uh, flour allergens. Uh, doesn't react to the enzyme, which is also a potential allergen, which can cause uh, Baker's asthma. And so uh, the question is, what do you need to really confirm the diagnosis of occupational asthma? And the next slide show that, uh, that we do a, a workplace challenge uh, where we have a patient use a uh, electronic uh, peak flow meter with a memory chip uh, that's able to uh, follow, he's able to follow his peak flows under supervision and he, as you can see on days when he's not working with the flower, he's fine, but then there's a dramatic decline in his lung function on Monday when he's working with the uh, flower and uh, this is uh, adequate for us to, in addition to a positive polling test to confirm he has asthma, but this actually is, uh, this workplace challenge does uh, confirm the diagnosis. Next slide. Uh, here's another example of a workplace challenge done in a uh, surgical ICU nurse who was using powder latex gloves, which contains uh, natural rubber latex proteins, and there are many allergens that were described at that time. Unfortunately, uh, nearly all facilities are latex uh, free in terms of gloves. Uh, but uh, this is the type of response we saw when the nurse was working with the gloves, uh, and these were powdered gloves with large amounts of proteins to which she was sensitized. And you can see that. When she was using uh, the gloves in the, in the surgical ICU, her FEV1 dropped dramatically. We got her right out of there, and, and she was restricted from that exposure thereafter. But uh, this is really how you do and confirm uh, asthma, uh, even in a work setting. Next slide. And here are some of the lists of, uh, you know, protein allergens that have been associated with occupational asthma. Uh, in terms of detergent workers, uh, there are a number of proteases, 
Uh, these are derived from uh, cell subtilis, so microbial bacterial enzymes, but also fungal enzymes, which are usually recombinant enzymes that are used as ingredient detergents to cut all the protein. And uh, these are excellent uh, cleaning agents. Uh, bakers, as we already mentioned, may be exposed to amylase uh, used in uh, flour to control fermentation of the bread as the dough rise. Um, and you can see there are a bunch of exposures here. Uh, laboratory animal workers who were exposed to fats uh, and uh, urine proteins. These have been characterized by a bunch of other pig processes. And these are uh, other natural colors. I don't think we can, we can't hear you again, sorry. At all? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or we can now. Uh, we lost you on the start of case three. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay. So, um, these are some other allergens that uh, are derived from plants that are encountered in a variety of occupations. So, the last case is a 26 year old, all the parts of her, uh, with no prior history of asthma. Uh, the worker uh, was doing well and then one day was exposed to the uh, sulfur dioxide fume. Exposure lasts. 30 minutes, but this was an accidental exposure that he, that he encountered uh, during a waste treatment process. And then an hour of this off chest light also saw his bleeding taken to the emergency room. And uh, he had normal physical. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, this is a retrospective diagnosis. So it, it's the best one can do, but it is something to see. And here are some of the causes that the associates had. Accidental exposure to chlorine gas. Individuals in sawmills put sulfur dioxide, of course, that has high irritant tension and cause. So, uh, we've, we've been able to define occupation as a so far recognized cause of prevalence and describe an approach to evaluating occupation as a, we'll talk a little bit about how to manage. Excellent. Uh, so, to diagnose occupational asthma, it's due to a sensitizer uh, reduction in and uh, or avoidance, complete avoidance of exposure and definitely without. And you do want to remove or if you've identified a specific sensitizer that is caused. Uh, generally, workers with reactive airway dysfunction caused by urine safe to return to the workplace as long as you control future exposure and prevent uh, accidental exposure to high level irritant, or they can be put in some other area. Um, we generally treat with medication as per the guidelines, but one should not ever consider uh, pharmacotherapy as an alternative to a significant reduction or elimination of exposure in a patient with occupational asthma. There have been actually uh, deaths occurring in the work environment, symptomatic workers with uncontrolled asthma, uh, and exposure is not uh, mitigated uh, adequately. Uh, and then it's important, uh, if you have one case, uh, to discuss management, the necessity to monitor continuously workplace exposure and prevent cases 
And if you do have a bill, potential incentivizer, sometimes a routine uh, periodic mail-in program uh, can be very effective. So this shows uh, a, a sort of um, regression analysis of uh, some data that was generated uh, following some of these work like mass pumps uh, while they were still exposed. See that on the left was a steep uh, reduction and loss of FEV1 over time. And using this model, we just go back after the uh, exposure modified. Uh, you can see the decline of lung function over time. Uh, the slope decline uh, was reduced substantially, uh, really showing the effort of, uh, of exposure modification. And so, uh, primary prevention is the best we can do. Uh, prevent highly cases. We identify size and we look for another uh, replacement uh, uh, agent or process uh, that will eliminate both that sensitivity. And the best example of this was the late technology episode. Approximately uh, 30 years ago, uh, every uh, Every abstract sentence uh, about latex. So this was prevalent among health workers using latex gloves and uh, that released large amounts of, uh, of protein to the air, and many workers became sensitized. And once the gloves were modified so that uh, the latex content was reduced, or the gloves were coated so that these became less available in terms of worker exposure to skin or through uh, breast exposure. The number of cases you can see from this one study uh, has been reduced substantially. I don't think we see any new cases anymore because uh, we've the uh, eliminated through prevention. So uh, again, other options um, you know include use of respirators, moving inner areas. Um, uh, these can be done, uh, but can work really sick. Uh, in most cases, you need to eliminate exposure uh, if they have problems with the sensitizer. But the problem is that if you do this, then they may not try and place them, give them another job. It can't be done. These patients go on workers' uh, compensation. You do lose income substantially despite that. So you have to be really sure about the diagnosis before you make that type of recommendation. That's why the objective confirmation of the diagnosis is so important. Next slide. And then uh, occupational rhinitis is uh, often seen. Uh, there may be a very high prevalence of this, and it's probably more common than occupational asthma. And uh, especially uh, if you're talking about natural protein sensors, there's rhinitis, monocular conjunctival, very common, and often proceed to help occupational asthma, and less common with chemical causes of occupational asthma. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. I apologize for some of the technical problems. Uh, I, had, I had one question. I don't know if anybody's ever looked at this, but if somebody had a prior history, let's say, of like um, wheat, like allergy to food or egg, and they lose it, are they at any increased risk for any of these occupational asthma, just from the sensitization? Yeah, we, we have looked at this in uh, egg processing workers, and um, in most cases, uh, they could tolerate eating uh, eggs, but they had asthma when they were exposed by inhalation. Now, there were a a few workers, but it was very uncommon that actually had uh, previous egg sensitization and then also developed occupational asthma when they were exposed uh, in their egg processing facility to aerosols containing egg white protein. Uh, but this was relatively uncommon. Most of the workers could tolerate the food uh, in terms of eating, but uh, only had problems with respiratory exposure. Uh, All right. Thank you for the great talk, and sorry about all the yeah. uh, difficulties. It happens. <laughs> but we got through it. Good.
Good. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again. Okay. You have a good one. Yes, you do.